Yes. There we go. Now we're on. Good. Let's stand and sing onward, Christian soldiers. Good morning, Chapel family. Good morning, Fabian. Well, we pray, please. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your presence here. It's, it's necessary for us to present all time here, Father. Thank you, Lord, for each one people for here today. Thank you for this service. Blessing, Father, the service. Blessing the communion. Blessing the all time for you today. Father, Father God, we we are nothing without you. Amen. We need you. Please. We need you. You feel to feel the our lead, our heart. Thank you, Lord, for all day. Thank you for your choice us here. We lost in the world, and you chose us. Thank you, Lord. Blessing today, and in the name of the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Let's do one more, and then we'll have Mickey give you an outro. Old Rugged Cross. <laughs>
Good morning, Chapel family. Today is Communion Day, <laughs> first, first Sunday in March. Okay. We have praise reports this week. We have Jerry Young, Delma Hartnett, Larry Harvey, and Danny Godwin. We have prayer requests this week. We have Amy Andrews, Les Battershell, Jackie McClanahan, Wayne Mayfield, Johnny Jones, Cheyenne Johnson, Cindy Eggleston, and Don the bartender at the casino. Oh, his daughter, okay. Um, we also have Kathy Sabine, Mary Engelhart, Charlie Greener, Marcella, Jessica Cabrera, Luke, Janice, Emily Saints, Matthew Weinman, DJ and her dad, Kaylin Salazar, Paul Vescovo Jr., and Sammy. Um, last week we asked for prayers for Dean Hawkins for a peaceful passing and he did pass, so this week please pray for his family and friends who are going to miss him, as well as Casey Carden and J.B. Rogers and Robert Paul Yeager. We have a birthday coming up this week, Darlene Hart, on March 5th. For the children, we have Children's Sunday School at 1030 with Amy and Romina. We have Kids Club on Thursday nights at 5.30 with Amy and Romania. <laughs> Romina. Uh, we have Sunday School at 9.30, led by Penny and sometimes Sandy. Sandy was doing it this morning. Thank you, Sandy. We have the Ladies Fellowship at 4 o'clock on Tuesdays here at the chapel. We have Disciples Discipleship Bible Study, which is a self-driven, self-paced course. Please see Daryl if you want to start. And that's about it for this week's announcements. Have a blessed week, everybody. Before we pray today, I just wanted to... Um, read something from our book if I can find it here when a church was a, to about to build a new building the people were divided with reference to its location and how it should look and I picked this because of course we're building a new building <laughs> kind of resting on the pulpit up here <laughs> but um, the preacher delivered a very strong sermon and the sermon had its desired effect. It even brought tears to the eyes of the deacons, and that's a good sign when deacons cry. The next morning, one of the deacons called one another, and they said, Our minister is right, and we are em imperiling the cause of Christ by our division. And I have come to tell you that we must compromise, and now you must give up, for I can't. But as we, uh, as we move forward with this building, I'll keep you in, up, to, up to speed with it. We have the pad done. We have the pad done now, and it's, uh, they'll start the foundation work this week, and it should be uh, moving right along from this point. So we're blessed. Would we all stand for a moment for prayer? Father, today as we have joined here together, I pray for unity amongst us, not any division in a building, Lord, that's just humor, but there is times when we disagree with those we love and those we are close to, and I pray that we can just find your will in all that we do and find your compassion and your willingness to um, just bring peace to all situations. We find that peace in you. I pray that as we go through this service also that we'll hear from your word and from the music that's being played, that our hearts will be turned towards you with a burning desire to live our lives for you. We just ask that you be with us again. In the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. Blessed assurance. <laughs>
with your rest of the ministry. So fifty some odd years this man got up with every message he had. He wanted to tell everybody that God loved him. And he also wanted to tell everybody that the way to salvation was through Jesus Christ. And at the end of every one of his sermons at the Crusades that day, they sang just those out. Had anyone in here ever attended a Billy Graham crusade? I have. I remember uh, not only that, but hearing him on television. And it brought tears to my eyes every time, and it was such a simple message. As I mentioned, I, I may have told you this before, but in that message, it's the message of hope. And it comes through Christ only, salvation in him, trusting in him. What did you do? What do I have? What do I have? Do you remember Jed Clampett? Do you remember how that started with him out there and he'd shoot that gun and black gold, Texas tea. You know the story of poor people becoming rich and that black gold was for them. They moved on to Hollywood. And you know the rest of the story. But we're going to read about a poor widow out of, the, the, you know, out of Second Kings. And out of this story, I want you to see that with God, all things are possible. That God, when he, comes, uh, when he comes to us and brings us along in life, nothing is impossible. So let's read together, 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elijah, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he, was revered, he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elijah replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a little oil. Elijah said, Go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. 
Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and afterward shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were filled, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, There is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went, and she told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil, pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. This is a foundational truth that we're going to be going over today, one that God will provide for our needs. And I think of this group, and in, in the United States especially, and our needs are so varied. A lot of times it's not financial need that we're facing. So this isn't just a message about financial needs or providing the next meal. This is the provision of God for those things deep in your life, the fears that you have, the things in your life that you maybe can't conquer, like an addiction or whatever's going on in your life. This is what this message is about. This is God being able to step in and being faithful when we turn our lives over to Him. And that's the key. That's the key. Many people pray, you know, if only I win the lottery or, you know, they're looking for all those things, but they're missing in their life is the righteousness that God brings. It's a righteousness we can't earn on our own. It's a righteousness that comes when we place our faith in Him and we're made right with God. It's not something you strive for. It's something that God does. And when we get to that point, when we start living that way, we begin to see these truths that I'm preaching about today come to your life so that you can place that kind of trust in Him knowing that you've accepted all that He has and you're living according to His will, not by your might, but by His might, by His strength. When Elijah, he succeeded Elijah, and it gets kind of confusing, but he was a mentor. He was mentored by Elijah. And Elijah, if you read his story, he was very bold. He, he, he preached the truth. He was a fiery spokesman for God. And Elijah, he came along, and he was, he was such a man of compassion and mercy. That's what, what he was noted for. And if you look and you think about Jesus' ministry, when you hear Jesus was full of grace and truth. And so both of these prophets were fulfilling what Jesus came to do, and that was preach the truth, Elijah, Elijah, and Elijah with that grace. And so the story begins, of course, the woman suddenly widowed. Her husband was part of Elijah's disciples and part of the company of prophets that if you remember the story, King Ahab and Jezebel, they tried to kill God's prophets. And so it says in 1 Kings 18.4, Why Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two caves, fifty in each, and had supplied them with food and water. Now this widow is the widow of Obadiah because he was killed. But if you get out of that text, you can see that out of his own funds, he supplied food and nourishment to these prophets. That's 50 guys. And if you know anything about preachers, they can eat a lot. So, <laughs> so he, was, he was supplying their needs while they're in this cave. And then he's killed. And here is his widow with two sons. And they probably took on debt to supply this food for these prophets. And so she's in debt. Obadiah, at great risk and personal cost, provided for God's people. And this widow, in danger of losing everything, she turns to God. She turns to that prophet and says, I'm in need. Slavery, when we think of those two boys being taken into slavery, slavery is alive and well today. And you think, wow, I don't, I don't see any slavery. Slavery is a debt, and it's all around us. Debt can be a slave master. Borrower, it says in Proverbs 22, 7, the borrower is the servant of the lender. And if you ever think about in our system, when people get into debt, and I think about people that I've been in the court system with, and I know it's not uh, the court's fault that these people get in trouble, but they become enslaved to something that sometimes they don't have the money, they don't have the means uh, to take care of these things, and they, they become crushed by debt. I owe, I owe, 
and off to work I go. Anybody been there? <laughs> a lot of hands went up. A lot of hands went up. Jay Clark says, once you're in debt, interest will be your companion every minute of the day or night, and it's working against you. It has no love, no sympathy. It is as hard and soulless as a granite cliff, and you cannot dismiss it. Whenever you get in its way, or you cross its course, or fail to meet its demand, it crushes you. And that's where this woman found herself. And if, and if any of you have been there, you know the crushing weight of debt. But understand this, no matter what you're indebted to, because sin is that same kind of master. When we are giving in to sin, when we live our lives not according to God's way, we're crushed under the weight of that sin and guilt. And God says, in the same way, He will provide for our needs. That is a need that each one of us need. We need His grace, His mercy, His forgiveness, His strength. And we got to understand this first point that God cares for us deeply. Our holy, almighty, all-loving God knows your needs and hears your cries. He knows what is at the deepest part of your heart, what you're hurting about. You know, people that have been displaced, he knows those people, and he knows their struggles and their fears. He knows those that are abused, and he knows injustice, and he's working on our behalf. He knows those sinful thoughts and actions that overtake us, but he's made that provision for us through his son, Jesus Christ. And when debts pile up, he wants nothing more than to step by our side and show that he's true. And he especially cares for widows and orphans. And Melanie added this, and I agree. Divorcees, children that are being raised by a single parent, they're as much an orphan as one that doesn't have a father because we have so many in this country that are being raised by moms. In fact, I have two nephews back there that way. God especially. cares for them. Psalm 68, 5. He is a father to the fatherless. A defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling. And Psalm 146, 9. The Lord watches over and sustains the fatherless and the widows. And James 1, 27. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after orphans and widows in their distress. You know, church, when we join together here, that's part of our call. That's, that's what God is all about. When we have kids here in the, in the summertime, many of them are single parent raised kids. Many of them are just pretty much left to run around the track here. And when we can step up and be show kindness, when we can be that father to the fatherless, that's what God is calling us to do. The men in this room, my nephews, I'm the only, I can't go there. I'm the, I'm the only guy they have in their life. Besides everybody else in there. That's right. So when you pick them up and show kindness, you're showing God's love. You know, some of you can relate to pain and emptiness. And you can relate to this widow when she was about to lose the, her greatest love were her two kids. He hears, he heard her cry and he hears your cry. And he wants to defend and he wants to sustain. Wants to sustain you. Whatever burden you're bearing or whatever you're wrestling with. Emma, you're not helping me. I perform weddings sometimes, and I do real good until they start breaking down, and I have that happen occasionally, and it's like, oh, don't do that. 
But in Psalms 50, it says, Call on me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you. And in Psalms 34, 15, 17, and 19, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. These are great promises out of Psalms. And Psalms 10, you hear, O Lord, the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them and you listen to their cry. Defending the fatherless and the oppressed in order that man who is on the earth may be terrified no more. In other words, he takes away that fear. He gives hope where there's people in this world that have no hope. And when they turn to him, he begins to build their life the way he's designed. He begins to bring them into a, into a way of living that the Bible talks about where we can trust. We know that our cry and our pleas and our prayers are a direct line to God himself because we have that confidence because we know what he's done here. He's made righteous the unrighteous. And in that way, we become a friend of God, close to God, so that no matter what our pleas and our cries, we know that God, according to his will, is working on our behalf. That's the kind of confidence I want each of us in here to have, that you know that you know, that when you ask God that, that he's not there with earplugs in, but he's there listening, He's there, attentive to that cry. Countless times in my life, I know what that's like. I know what it's like to cry out to God and to watch as He works and He, he steps into those situations and brings about not always the desire I had, but He brings out an outcome that's pleasing to Him, furthers the kingdom of God, and grows me spiritually. Those are the kind of things that God does countless times for me, and I know that if we had those stories to share together, we'd have many. And the greatest part of this story is the second point. It says God uses our little to do much. What do you have in your house? That's what the prophet said. What do you have in your house? And I'm sure she, first thing she said, nothing. You know, sometimes when God comes to us, he says, I need you to do this, this, or this. Or, you know, you feel that draw from him to step up. I'm not qualified. I don't, I don't have that ability. or I'm not, I don't have that kind of personality. And he says, just give me your little, and I'll do much with it. She said, that's all I have is a little oil. And you know how the story goes. She closes the door. And just like Jed Clampett, she struck it rich in oil. <laughs> she struck it rich. Olive oil at that time was a precious commodity. It was used for cooking. It was used for cosmetics and medicine, a source of light. They burned oil, announcing a king's birth or burying the dead. It was bartered and traded, and she had a lot of it. God blessed her. God honored the life of her husband as he served him. And that's how this works. God looks down, and he sees what you're doing and what you're giving and how you're, how you are part of his kingdom operation. And he wants nothing more than us to just throw ourselves totally into that. And we watch him bless. We hold back and say, oh, I need that little bit of oil. But she said, that's all I have. Can you imagine the first thing when she started to pour it out? She probably said, this is all I have. And then she watched it grow. We have more than we think when we offer God the little that we have. That's an important part of faith, is to not, think we, not to think that we need to come to him already ready to do the great things he has for us, but to just come and say, here I am, Lord, use me. Bring our little, and he'll do a lot with it. God multiplies it and uses things in our lives, our experiences and our even our frail faith, and he uses that for great things. He used two weak senior citizens for a nation to be born in Abraham and Sarah, and he used a little boy, Joseph, sold into slavery to become a, 
one of the rulers of Egypt to be able to save the Israelites in their time of need when there was a famine. He used a shepherd boy, Jesus, to be king, the greatest king Israel has ever had, and the greatest king of all, our king, Jesus. And he used a skimpy lunch on the Sermon of the Mount from that boy that gave his lunch and fed 5,000. He uses little for much. You may think what you have is insignificant, but in God's eyes, that's all he's wanting is for you to open up and say, use me. There was an illiterate man, and he had gotten saved through the Salvation Army, and he, he kept going back and helping at the store. And he noticed that all the other guys in the store had red sweaters. You may have heard, I've told this story before, it's a cute story, but so he goes home and he's all discouraged and his wife said, what, what, what's going on? Why are you so discouraged? He said, they all have red sweaters. She said, well, I'll knit you one. So she knitted him a red sweater and he went back there and then he came back home and he was still discouraged. He said, they have some kind of writing on their sweaters and she was illiterate too. She said, well, I'll put some kind of words on there and as she went to her sewing room to put some words on she saw a sign hanging in the store across the street, so she just copied the letters onto his sweater. He went back over there to Salvation Army, and when he got home, he had a big smile. And she said, well, did they like your sweater? He said, they liked my sweater better than their own. And on his sweater, little did she know or he knew, but it was under new management. <laughs> <laughs> under new management. That's what this is all about. Are you under new management? Have you come to that point where you say, God, I want to do it your way. I want to live your way. I want you to manage my life. I want you to give me the strength to do it right. You know, if we just give a little or pray a little or attempt a little, we'll get a little. We'll maybe hear a little from God and accomplish just a little for him. But if you give a lot and you pray a lot, if you attempt a lot for God, you can't even imagine what will happen because he adds to that. He adds to that, just like the extra oil. We blossom with abundance with God. Ephesians 3.20 says, By his mighty power at work in us, he is able to accomplish indefinitely more than we could ever dare, ask, or hope. Our little is much in God's hands. And the third thing, God is our ultimate provider. <coughs> the widow knew who to run to. She was in a time of need. And there's a testimony that I heard last night, and I'd, I had gotten an email about it. Over in Artesia, there's a, a lady over there, and when she was younger, she was addicted to drugs and in a very bad situation, bad marriage. And her husband happened to be gone one night, and they shot up her house, and she was just there with her little baby. And she prayed as she was on the floor ducking bullets. She prayed, God, if you'll get me out of this, I'll turn my life around, which she did. And she went on to raise her child without that husband in Artesia, and not long ago diagnosed with cancer. And her doctor said, you know, gave her the diagnosis. And she went to Mayo Clinic, or the Mayo Clinic asked for the slides and told her, definitely, you have cancer. And um, she said, well, I'm about to buy a house. And they said, well, I wouldn't recommend that to, because of this type of cancer. And she, she told her friend, I'm going to buy that house anyway because it's going to show. I, I know who my God is and how he has taken care of me in the past. And it would show lack of faith if I didn't follow through on this. So she bought that house and went to Mayo Clinic. When they did the study on her and finished everything, they said, you're cancer free. You see, God stepped in and, and was her provider in the past, and she knew she could trust him now. Just like this widow. Who did she go to? She knew the prophet was there, Elijah. And she knew God could meet that need. And she went to God for that need. 
we have to understand that, that he guides us and he provides for us. We weren't created to be independent of him. We weren't created to try it all on our own and then come to him when we can't succeed. We're to come to him first and say, Lord, direct me in these decisions. Direct me in every decision of my life, no matter how small, so that I'm in line with what you have for me, the will for my life, your will for my life. We are designed to obey him, to seek him, to learn from him, to ask him for that wisdom and help. Luke 12, 29 and 31 to 31 says, Do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it, for the pagan world runs around after such things, and your Father knows that you need them. Here's the key. But seek ye first the kingdom, and all these other things will be given unto you as well. You see, that's our focus, should be our focus here in this room. We should be focusing on God and his kingdom wholeheartedly, seeking him, looking for what his will is for each one of us so that we, like this poor widow, we become rich with the things of God. Our little becomes much. Second Corinthians, I'm going to read just the first part of this verse. It says, God made him who has no sin to become sin, to become sin for us. It's a reversal of destiny. This widow, that was a reversal of destiny that God provided for, and God, through Christ Jesus, provides us with a reversal of destiny. I'm going to finish that verse now. It says that we, the unrighteous, could become the righteousness of God. Exactly what I was reading out of Psalms. We become the righteousness of God. And when we do so, we have that ear of heaven. We have God's ear. We know that we're living according to his will. Again, not by our own strength. I've tried too many times just to try to muscle up and be a good guy. That doesn't last very long, does it now? <laughs> it's only when we're focusing on the kingdom. I'll tell anybody that's struggling with an addiction or anything in their life, that when they focus on the kingdom of God and start to do the things of the kingdom, that those things fall away. And that's what God has called us today. He's called us to become rich in Him. Every time a poor sinner comes to faith in Jesus, he or she leaves with abundance. That's a promise of God, that abundance of eternal life. You know, as we have communion today, I'm going to have Fabian. Where is Fabian? Or Melanie. <laughs> We're going to have communion. And I'm going to turn this off. And Nikki, would you help with communion? Oh, here comes Fabian. Pray before we take it together. Oceans. 
Grace abounds in deepest waters, your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail when fear surrounds me, you may. So will rest in your embrace. I am yours. You are mine. Oh.
Why don't we all stand as we get ready to partake? You know, on that night when Jesus took that bread and he broke it, he said, this is my body which is broken for you. And he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. Do all this in remembrance of me. And that new covenant, of course, is when we place our trust in him, when we believe him truly for our salvation. God changes us within. We're under new management. Let's pray. Lord, as we remember these stories from the Old Testament, when we see how you were faithful and you are faithful to so many in this world, to each of those who place their trust in you, and I pray that we take that step of faith today if we haven't already, and we believe truly that we are your righteousness when we come to you and trust in you. Father, I ask that for today and each day that we place our hearts in your hands. Go with us, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing God Bless America before we leave.